Hey everyone, welcome to this talk on the life of Edith Stein, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. As many of you know, with the beginning of the lectures on the Critique of Pure Reason, I did, and still do, seek to tackle a lot of continental philosophy, what is known as continental philosophy, in chronological order. Of course, this takes time, and it means that many of the thinkers that sort of hold a special place in my heart, or those that I turn to in day-to-day -day life, might not really get recorded for a long time, and Stein is one of them. And Edith Stein's work and her life is sort of a recent interest of mine the last year or so, and it's sort of taken a hold of me for reasons I've yet to really fully discern, um, but it's probably because her philosophy is implicitly something which is clearly to be lived, and something to be. And obviously with the recent conversion and Stein also being a convert, but Stein also uh, being part of the continental tradition, so to speak, which is, you know, what I'm sort of trained in and what, what I adore. Th there's something there which really uh, drew me to her work. And this is why I really wanted to begin with Stein, actually, with this talk on the life of her. So, you know, famously, especially specifically from the continental tradition, Heidegger famously, famously says that, you know, Aristotle, he was born, he lived and he died, basically saying that the biography of or the biographical details of philosophers is really irrelevant in terms of their uh, their philosophy. Like, we don't need to know it. Um, I don't think there is probably a philosophical, it, whether or not that's a philosophical statement, I don't think there's something said by a philosopher that I actually disagree with more. Um, there's certainly philosophers and thinkers out there who delving into their biography probably isn't going to give you all that much extra context and detail uh, in terms of their philosophy. But I would also argue that that's a spectrum and on the one on the other side of that spectrum, there are of course philosophers who actually without knowledge of their biography or the biographical context of which they're working or uh, developments which they've been through personally, to be honest, you're probably never going to really fully understand their work. And I would say that that applies to the majority of philosophers, really. I don't think there's many in the camp where you could just entirely ignore it. Um, to say that I, I don't want to reduce all philosophy to saying, oh, it's or everything's of its time. But ultimately, you know, there is a, a sort of a grain of truth in that that can't be ignored. And so with Stein, I want to tackle actually three of her works, uh, which are in sort of three eras of her, of her life, as you'll see. But these these eras overlap and blur, you know, it's not clear cut. But the first one after this this talk, and hopefully after this talk, you'll see why emphasizing the life of her is so important. So the first book I want to tackle is on the problem of empathy, which is firmly rooted in her work with Husserl, Edmund Husserl, the founder of phenomenology, and her early phenomenological work, which is sort of strictly academic and philosophical, and then the science of the cross as she enters into the Carmelite, um, into the Carmelites, and then uh, potency and act, which is actually in a sort in a, in a certain sense, it's a combination of these two factors of her life: the ph phenomenology and her conversion to Catholicism. Um, but but I do really think that the life of Edith Stein is so important to her work that I, that I and it's and it's a really beautiful life that I wanted to give this talk first. So Stein is Edith Stein was born in Breslau, uh, now Rocklo in Poland, which I think would be Rocklab, uh, on the twelfth of October, eighteen ninety one. Um, she's the youngest of. 11 children with some being literally adults um before she's born um it, it said in life in a jewish family which is one of the texts that i'm drawing from uh which is the uh, the autobiography in shine's own words which was obviously cut short for certain reasons of her writing um which we'll get to that the family was split into the boys the girls and the children and the latter two children being made up of edith and her sister erna um, who was only 18 months older and they sort of grew a very strong bond um, sort of inevitably because of this fact now before we jump in before I go any further I should say I do want to talk about the text that I'm drawing from so of course life in a Jewish family is probably one of the best documents we really have for the biographical detail of Edith Stein's life it comes from Edith Stein herself who's very sincere um, whether or not we could we could sort of critique how she's written it is that that's up for up for a, a, a critic of biographers and not for myself to say but it's a great it's a great 
it's a great text of its of its own merit. Um, alongside this, one of the books that I'm primarily drawing from is Edith Stein, The Life and Legacy of St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross by Maria Ruiz Scapalanda. Um, and this is actually really helpful because it's a book which is a biography which draws from all the other biographical stuff which is out there, which there's quite a few things which, for some reason, all the biographical detail is split and certain things are only in certain places. Um, another text that I've also drawn from is Edith Stein, a biography by Walter Oud Herbstrith, which you'll see me reference quite a few times, with the subtitle, The Untold Story of the Philosopher and Mystic Who Lost Her Life in the Death Camps of Auschwitz. Um, that is one. And then just for a few other bits, which are, were difficult to find elsewhere, uh, just as preparation for many of the Stein things, is a book uh, by Dermot Moran called Edmund Husserl, Founder of Phenomenology, which actually obviously is primarily about the life of Husserl and more so about the philosophy of Husserl. But there's a few bits in there about the relationship between Stein and Husserl, which actually I couldn't find elsewhere. So that's been very helpful. So those are the books um, that I'm primarily drawing from for this. And so back to Stein's life, of critical importance um, is the fact that Stein was born into a very observant Jewish family. I mean, they weren't um, perhaps... <laughs> Jewish or religious in the sense, in the modern sense that many families may say they're religious, but they don't, they're not really observing anything, you know, families these days might not say grace or anything like that. This was a very observant Jewish family and Stein's mother was extremely, uh, extremely observant of her Jewish faith and, and it was a major factor in her life. It wasn't, it was a clear factor in her life and something of extreme importance. And Stein herself was born on Yom Kippur, uh, the holiest day of the Hebrew calendar. And this, combined with the fact that she's the youngest of all 11 children, um, alongside also being quite small when she's young, quite frail in nature, um, she becomes sort of unquestionably, in terms of what I can read, a favorite, a favorite of her mother's. Um, uh, and this is a point which is really emphasized in various letters as well. And so... This is sort of the, the, the family and the household which Stein's being being born into and, and the atmosphere of this very observant Jewish family where the spirituality of Judaism is extremely important, uh, especially to her mother, who then plays an even bigger role in her life because the death of Stein's father happens at a very young age. And this this no doubt, of course, factored into the bolstering of the relationship of the family and also the relationship of Stein to her mother. And from a young age, she was clearly and undoubtedly intellectually and also emotionally uh, gifted, in, especially in terms of sort of the ability to truly, sincerely empathize. And this is a trait which actually Stein's mo mother, which is probably another factor for the bolstering of their relationship, and it's really important to emphasize the closeness of them, um, the traits of Edith in, ter in terms of being intellectually gifted were actually allowed to grow uh, in the family household via her mother's sort of openness towards critical thinking, which I guess in the, in the you know, uh, we're talking now 1896 and onwards, early 1900s is quite a rare trait, and especially in terms of, you know, of course, at the time, Stein being a woman. And now, the family, as I've said, were Jewish, Stein's mothers, devoutly Jewish, and the faith played a primary role in the mother's life. However, many of the siblings, I would say, simply took the, the such faith for granted and, you know, entered into that sort of modern relationship with faith or something in the background. But there is this clear, clear beginning with for Stein in terms of understanding religion and faith as being something that can be of central importance and not subsumed into that then growing modern relationship with religion where it's just something that's there and it's just taken for granted and you know now we might think back and think of course that now stein is um canonized as a saint we might think that maybe she was like this her entire life but not at all actually stein you know despite you know she, she wasn't a paragon of virtue in her young age she was prone to tantrums, pranks, um, very stubborn. And the stubbornness actually um, continues for a long, long time. Um, she does write even amidst this sort of, the t she does write 
which is very um, rare, I think, for someone of such a young age, amidst the, the typical tantrums and pranks and stubbornness of a young person, she does write, and this is in, in Life in a Jewish Family, of a hidden world, um, of sort of an emotional sensitivity, um, which which is far more developed than we'd think of would be sort of realized in a child. Um, and it was an emotional sensitivity that many would shrug off. Uh, for instance, if one was to mention murder to in her presence, she might lay awake at night at the thought of it because it's just too much. And she never really mentions this interior life. And actually, throughout her entire life, Stein is extremely protective of her own personal inner world, even though she writes, you know, the, the idea of the internal life, uh, which really, I think, Frischlein begins to have its articulation in her reading of Teresa de Avila's um, work. This interior life is an underlying factor in all of Stein's writing, and yet we never really get a true glimpse into Stein's interior life herself. Um, she never mentions it, and if she was ever to really externalize it, um, especially when at a young age where I think perhaps she she didn't have full a uh, full understanding of what it was in terms of this. If you were to mention murder to her, it would be too much. It was sort of written off um, as nerves or sort of that typical neurotic um, attitude towards women, especially in that age. And so, at a, uh, around the age of seven, um, Stein has her first transformation of which really two more clear ones are to follow and at, at this age of seven it happens all at once and she can remember this quite quite clearly she suddenly understands that her mother this is the trans transformation she suddenly understands that her mother and her older sister Frida and once again remember that the, the difference in age in the Stein ch children of which they're 11 is so much that when Stein was born some of her siblings were already adults um, she understands that her mother and older sister Frida have more knowledge than her and they know what's good for her and so she makes this sort of transformational decision to just simply obey them um, her stubbornness falls away um, she's still a little bit naughty um, but she 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 has a different understanding regarding the pranks and the tantrums now and she very quickly seeks forgiveness and this is at the age of seven and However, there is this there's this strange strange difference where I think in relation to many things that Stein would agree with her mother and with her older sister Frida, and yet it's very very strange that the stubbornness seems to retain itself, as I said, in very clear decisions throughout her life. And so Edith still took it upon herself to make the decision, her own decision, at a very very young age, to start school a year earlier than than what one was disposed supposed to, um, and her mother just simply doesn't object. Um, I think there is there is such a relationship between them and such an almost a trust of Edith's clearly highly developed intellectual and emotional capabilities that her mother trusts her decision in that moment. And perhaps that had something to do with Edith herself then beginning to obey her mother and, and, and stopping this sort of uh, childishness at, at, a very, at a very young age where one could be forgiven for still being a child. And this outlook begins the formation of an internal foundation which was to carry through to to her death basically that this this obeying and then this making these very clear decisions and this all has some relation to her internal life which unfortunately we will probably never really get to really know what it is and i think that's completely fine and so as we sort of head into stein's education as one can really imagine um you know it's clear that stein was a, a gifted philosopher and a gifted writer one can imagine that yeah edith was a zealous student and one who had a passion for learning um and not just learning in in learning by rote in school or in the educational world but also she found a great joy in composing plays and skits alongside her schoolwork so she's always learning and she's also always creatively learning and this actually carries through as well a lot of these very playful joyous traits of edith carry carry all the way through to the carmelite monet uh the, the, the went her time in the order of the carmelites um however as soon as she's not in school she became reserved back to that interior world which she's still sort of developing and finding out what it is so however in 1906 um with this exact same resolve she decided at 
the age of 15, much like the decision she made at seven, uh, only eight years earlier, that she wanted a break from school at 15, which nowadays would seem like an absurd thing. And I think this really speaks to the trust in the family with regards to Edith's development as a person. And her mother states, uh, and this is from Life in a Jewish Family, I won't coerce you. Um, I allowed you to start school when you wanted to go. By the same token, you may now leave if that is what you want. And this, this relationship between Stein and her mother is clear that they have a very deep trust and a very deep bond. And so young Edith quits school and she travels to Hamburg. Um, the family really assumed, and they make a lot of assumptions throughout their life regarding Edith, which many of them just end up not ever really going to plan. The family assumed that she would simply finish school and enter into the process of attending university or, you know, contextual for women and for the time and for the place, of course. Um, but they, they, they just assumed that she would see the whole thing through. But no, e Edith quits school. She takes a break at 15, travels to her older sister Elsa in Hamburg. Um, and it's clear that a transformation, not, not a clear transformation as, as the one when she was seven, but a transformation takes place here because six months later, when her mother visits, she states that Edith had grown a lot because before she'd been quite small, quite frail. Um, in the picture here, you can see that Edith is very, very small. Um, she's just in the forefront, uh, the, the smallest, youngest girl. And she had, when her mother visits her, she, she'd grown a lot. She'd gained some weight and was radiant. She'd sort of really come into her own. And of note here is a very important fact in Edith's life um, very early on. There's an often repeated fact that Stein becomes became agnostic. And some commentators even say that she's an atheist. So some people, when they speak of the story of Edith Stein, they they, they talk about the 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 Jew become atheist, become Catholic. And it's I would argue as um Scapalander argues, and actually also I think Herbstrith argues, but there's a few others who say against this, um, that really this is a bit blown out of proportion. Okay, so some say that she becomes an agnostic or even an atheist in her teenage years, right? So what really happens here? So her time with Max and Elsa, her sister, um, may have led Stein to some doubts, but we don't really know, or we don't really have too much here, due to their lack of faith. Whether or not we can call it a lack of faith, I don't know, but in, in comparison to that observant household or the observant... Um, belief of her mother in with regards to judaism we could probably say that this is just this sort of barren faith of the modern world and so but for stein this sort of this ethical thing always remains this empathy that she clearly has this inherent empathy she has remains but she states in in life in a jewish family once again she says we are in the world to serve humanity deliberately and consciously i gave up praying here so this is the remark that a lot of people sort of um used to justify the, the 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 thing about agnosticism or atheism as if this remark on its own denotes a complete loss of faith and a move towards atheism and um we don't we don't know we simply don't know as i said stein guards her inner life very closely um I, perhaps it's related only to prayer considering she says i gave up praying here we don't know about her prayer life at this point perhaps for a time she was as agnostic who knows i would personally say just my own belief that no she didn't become uh atheist perhaps a sort of form of agnosticism in relation to strict observance to 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 certain uh, you know to certain confines which might be happening on her interior life that she couldn't I don't know, process in a certain way. But we, we simply don't know. And I, I to comment is, is, is a bit silly. What we do know, however, that once a decision was made for Stein, it was unlike a transformation. It was a like a transformation. And it was decided. Um, and so all these decisions in Stein's life are very clear cut. Either she's obeying or she's making these decisions for herself, probably from this interior life. And I would say that all of that, in a sense, is always obeying in a way. So at 17, Stein decides once again to try to become a student um, and enters with the help of tutors, uh, the Obersekunde, or of course, and of course she, she passes the uh, entrance exam with flying colours. It's sort of undoubtable at this point. So very brief overview of her time really as a student at this point. Edith and Erna, um, who studied together at this point, were alike most other students, um, and yet they they... You know, they drew many, many other like-minded, intelligent and thoughtful 
people into their circles. Um, some say as if magnetically they were perhaps not charismatic, but there was something about them, sort of radiance, perhaps. I don't want to dra dramatize it. But they drew some people to them. They enjoyed, you know, they enjoyed a lot of popular pursuits, which is very important later on in terms of this idea of sacrifice, you know, hiking, tennis, climbing. They lived quite frugally. They supported women's suffrage. And despite being patriotic Germans, they did steer clear of fanatic nationalism, which they saw as hand in hand with anti-Semitism. Um, so the the university years of Erna and Edith were studious and social, um, with Edith, as you can imagine, somewhat setting the pace, even though she had this seemingly very humble and gentle, empathetic nature. She is almost, it's seemingly um, in control of things and in control of her life. Um, so from 1911 to 1913, uh, Stein studies philosophy, psychology, history, and German philology at the University of Breslau uh, in the Department of Experimental Psychology. And here's a big change in Edith's life, because one day a friend hands her volume two of Edmund Husserl's Logical Investigations, volume two as well, of Logical Investigations, stating that it's where the rest get their ideas anyway. Right, just saying, like, don't bother with the rest. You know, they're they're all getting it from this guy. Her friend was uh, Doctor uh, Georg Moskiewicz. So, and he knew Husserl personally. So there's a, a, a connection immediately for Edith. So here is the section of Edith's biography, which many are sort of familiar with if they've just heard her name. Which is that um, if people have simply heard of Edith Stein, then it is often not due to her own merit, but because she was a disciple of, as they called him, the master, uh, that is Husserl. And so we enter into that um, section of her life. And so Edith Stein begins her study of phenomenology, which in, in a sentence, and I really hasten to put phenomenology into a sentence, but the mind is not receptive, but creative. It invents itself and constructs its truths that's from the introduction to phenomenology by Sokolowski um, I don't want to delve too much into the philosophy of either phenomenology or Stein in this because this is a talk on our life so I'm very reluctant to put phenomenology phenomenology into a sentence because I know it's a very dangerous thing to do but we will look into it uh, into phenomenology deeper as I give the talk on um, on the problem of empathy. So this internal problem which had followed Stein since she was longer, younger found a system uh, in with phenomenology which allowed it to be sustained and explored in a very rigorous way, but allowing the certain horizons to remain open for her. So in Göttingen, where she studied with herself, many horizons were open to her, specifically uh, the work of Husserl and the work of Scheler. And in general, faith. Faith became something anew again for Stein here. But as we've seen, Stein did still did retain some form of stubbornness of temperament. And so her conversion from Judaism to Catholicism would not really have been due to the influence of another. So Husserl is a Lutheran and uh, Scheler is... Max Scheler is a Catholic, and really, but most biographer, biographers argue that, as we can see from Stein's stubbornness, no amount of like pushing her or trying to influence her in a certain way would have pushed her towards a certain thing. It wouldn't be from advice or suggestion. Uh, it would have to be from a personal interior search for Stein. So in short, phenomenology here allowed her to open herself to the thought of God whilst retaining this objective rigor of knowledge that she had really um, um, respected and, and sort of uh, attended to with her studies, which is clearly very important for her, is that the rigor objective form of knowledge, the science of knowledge. I mean, one of her books, has, as I've said, is called The Science of the Cross, but it's equally, phenomenology actually allows this rigor to enter into domains such as faith. Um, and so as the Great War breaks out. Stein decides to volunteer with the Red Cross. Um, she serves an as an assistant nurse to the soldiers of Austria. Um, and as Patricia Hampel notes in her essay on Stein, which is cited from the Scapolanda book, it was clearly Edith's desire to disappear into devotion to a greater good. What appealed to her was the surrender of the individual life to a massive reality encompassing everyone. And for this work, Edith re received the Medal of Valor. So in 1916, never again called up for service, Stein at 24 years old passes her doctor 
and arranges to work with Husserl as his academic assistant. Um, now, one thing that's actually not mentioned in the biographies, but is mentioned in the Husserl text, is that this was unpaid. Uh, this isn't made clear in the biographies. This was unpaid. And also, her work is, is probably still is, but definitely at the time, was rarely acknowledged. It would have been a small note to say, and thanks to Stein for doing this. Usually the bigger players in terms of editing things. One notable example is, of course, Martin Heidegger uh, would be there. The big editors have, of course, sorted it out. And you've always, almost always with the cases of these things, you've got the person behind the scenes who actually did all the work. And in this case, it was Stein. And so her degree is conferred on March 30th, 1917. And that's, and she's, you know, she's has a doctorate. So November of this year, um, a beloved friend of Edith, a man named Adolf Reinach, um, a man who plays a very key role in Edith Stein's life, but I haven't really the time to discuss his life. Um, more can be found about that in the Scapolander book. He's killed, and it's a very, very dear friend of, of Stein's. He's killed on the, the war front. And this moment is marked as a, an extremely decisive one uh, in the conversion of Stein towards first Christ and then Catholicism. So, Edith went to see her friend Adolf Reinach's widow, um, Anna Reinach, expecting, and she's, she's of course, she's expecting, um, you know, a distraught and despairing woman. And to her surprise, Stein finds a committed Christian, suffering, but at peace. And Stein says, and this is from the Herbstra, um, it was my first encounter with the cross and the divine power that it bestows on those who carry it. For the first time, I was seeing with my very eyes the church, born from her Redeemer's sufferings, triumphant over the sting of death. That was the moment my unbelief collapsed and Christ shone forth in the mystery of the cross. So during this time of Edith's spiritual search, she also takes a trip to Frankfurt. And another very key moment in her conversion here is a very small moment, which, which you could probably gloss over. But she witnesses a woman who has clearly just been shopping, you know, out on her daily errands. She's just been shopping and she's actually, I think she's got bags of shopping. And she, she heads into an empty church and she just kneels silently in a pew. And Stein sort of sees this as just someone interrupting their daily affairs just to pray. You know, they don't need to go to this rigorous ceremony or the rigorous mass or the, 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 big, the, big, the big thing every week. She, she just quickly pops into the church just to pray and have a conversation with God whilst she's out shopping. And, you know, and outside of a service, Stein sees a single person just sit and have an intimate conversation with God. And as time trickles on, you know, Edith was basically beginning to decide between the Catholic and Lutheran churches. The decision between these two can possibly be linked as to Max Scheler, Catholic, and Husserl, Lutheran. And it's here I can begin to write more clearly, uh, or talk more clearly, of Stein's conversion. So it's 1921, and this is probably the biggest moment in terms of her conversion. It's 1921, and I believe um, she's at the home of her friend, Hedvig uh, Conrad Martius, it may be, but she's definitely a, fr uh, a friend's home. I believe it's that friend. Stein is drawn to a book on the shelf. Um, she doesn't really know why this, it's this book. She, she states elsewhere that she has no clue why it'd be that book, but she's drawn to this book, and it's the autobiography of Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa of Avila. And Stein read the book in one night. This is the truth, she proclaims. Her search sort of comes to, a, to an end there. The search comes to an end. The next day, the very next day, Stein purchases a missal and a copy of the Catholic Catechism. And at this time, as earlier, as I've said, if one was to ask Stein why she became Catholic, she might be able to mention these events and mention her friend Anna Reinach and she mentioning finding this book. But she would say, she would reply to those people, why did you become a Catholic? She would say, secretum miam mihi, which means the secret belongs to me. You know, no, I nor anyone can say why Stein became a Catholic or what she found in Teresa of Avila's work, which suddenly made that decision for her. The exterior sort of remains, but the inside is forever changed, which is actually quite a phenomenological quandary. So Edith re returns to Breslau. 
and begins attending Mass every morning. However, of course, there's a problem. As I've emphasized earlier, she has this extremely close bond to her mother, but her mother is an extremely observant Jew. So she tells her sister, Erna, to get her mother used to the idea of her becoming a Catholic. And eventually, Edith's mother just finds out and considers this to be an act of disloyalty. And I imagine that for Edith, and this is just my own personal opinion, I imagine for Edith, this is the first real hurdle in terms of her conversion. Um, of course, before she would know that this would upset her mother, but for her mother to finally say to her that this is an act of disloyalty would have been a, a very big deal for Edith, especially considering their closeness. So it's New Year's Day 1922, and Stein is baptized and receives her first communion. Um, from that day, that very day after she's she's baptized, Stein stated that it was her intention at the right time to enter the Order of St. Teresa of Avila, the Order of the Carmelites. But it was Edith's mother's suffering uh, in relation to the conversion which delayed this entrance into Carmel, you know, this, this act of disloyalty. Edith couldn't simply be convert and then jump straight into it. It would be too much, and she, she loved her mother and respected her mother a lot as to not do this. Um, such delay was also out of obedience to her spiritual directors as well who would have seen her talents as an academic as vital in in these in very turbulent times. So we're speaking here of roughly 1922 to 1933. And so as the next 10 years of Edith's life are primarily of academic interests, texts which I'll attend to in time, I'll lightly gloss over them, adding only that as she began to work in the Diocese of Spire at St. At Saint Magdalena's, she lived in a room adjacent to the nuns, and so was able to mimic for a long time before her entry into the Carmelites a monastic life. And so that's really where I turn to. This 10-year period is, um, which I sort of skip over here, is an academic period. Um, it's clearly a period of personal development for Stein, but it, th th there's a lot of writing that takes place here for Stein. Um, so that's really where I turn to. So in 1932, Stein heads to uh, Münster in Westphalia to teach at a Catholic institution living amongst nuns and students. On January 1933, Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany. Less than two months later, the first concentration camp op is opened in Dachau. So in April of 1933, Stein is told it's best to refrain from scheduling lectures that summer and just do some quiet research. A decision, of course, brought about by Nazi rule. You know, you're a Jew, you're also a woman, I don't know how much that would have affected him, but definitely Jew. Just don't schedule anything. Basically, you, we don't know what's going to happen, or we don't want you here. Who knows? Edith actually accepts this very calmly. Um, she sees this as the last hurdle between her and Carmel, as basically falling down, and now everything's open. By the end of April, she was seeking permission to seek admission to the Carmelite Order, and that's actually granted in mid-May of the same year. And she meets the, the Mother Prioress on May 20th, and waiting, kneeling close to the an altar of Teresa of Lisieux, she writes, she experienced the serenity of someone who had reached her goal. So on June 19th, 1933, Edith Stein is accepted to join Carmel Maria von Friedem of Cologne Lindenthal, and two months later, after some preparation, she is fully admitted on October 14th, the eve of the feast of her beloved mother, St. Teresa of Avila. And so now we move into her time in the Carmelites. So this really still came as a shock to many people, as I've said. Many people who knew Edith, her family and her friends probably thought that a certain amount of obedience would remain and Stein would just follow this sort of academic path and to many people's shock she had entered the the discalced Carmelites taking the name Sister Teresia Benedicta Acruz um, which is Latin for uh, Teresa Blessed by the Cross and known now canonized in English as Saint Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. So in Carmel Stein takes the history of Carmel tradition to heart and in relation to her name she says by the cross I understood the fate of the people of God after all, one cannot wish for a deliverance from the cross when one bears the noble title of the cross. Steiner would state always had a sense 
of a sincere end in relation to bearing one's cross. And it's actually something that's quite, one would say, peculiar, which runs throughout her life, is that she states a few times that she always thought that something would end in relation to her having to, metaphorically speaking or allegorically speaking, bear the cross, um, which she does. And she says, the burden of the cross that Christ assumed is that of corrupted human nature with all its consequences in sin and suffering to which fallen humanity is subject. The meaning of the way of the cross is to carry this burden out of the world. The lovers of the cross, whom he has awakened and will always continue to awaken anew in the changeable history of the struggling church. These are his allies at the end of time. We too are called for that purpose. This is from a paper she writes, Love of the Cross, Some Thoughts for the Feast of St. John of the Cross. So to help Christ carry his cross, to willingly take on suffering, is to fill oneself with joy. Stein wished to devote herself fully to prayer, but perhaps, unlike Thomas Merton, was asked to finish her philosophical work once again. People see that Stein is very gifted, and, and you know to take on fully on this life of prayer, there's still this ability and talent there, which should be used. Um, and in these years, she writes Potency and Act, which is uh, finishes from the Spire, Finite and Eternal Being, Life in a, in a Jewish Family, uh, and the Science of the Cross, alongside various other essays and letters and, and, and much, much work. So in 1936, uh, Stein's mother dies of stomach cancer. Stein had entered into Carmel in 1933 and actually had not seen her mother since. Edith stated that she was never could make her mother comprehend her conversion or entrance into the order, or likely her conversion into Catholicism. She was unable to basically comfort um, her mother, who she was extremely co close to, loved dearly. She was unable to comfort her months before her death and unable to comfort her in the decision she made. So at this time, of course... Um, the world of Nazi Germany is churning. You know, things are well underway. The machine is churning and turning. And inside Carmel, however, almost anathema to the pure darkness of Nazi Germany is the light of Carmelite tradition, wherein Stein is remembered by her fellow nuns as being humorous, um, humble and modest. Um, uh, a woman with a clear ability to empathize with others, to know their state. A woman who, whilst young experienced all the outside world had to offer, such as tennis, hiking, boating, loads of other things, as I've said, was now behind the walls of Carmel and, and never mentioned this previous life that she had of, you know, going to Gottingen and meeting Husserl and doing all these brilliant things with her sister. She didn't mention this. She was completely fine behind these behind the walls of Carmel. So on Christmas Eve, um, 1936... Edith Stein's sister, Rosa, converts also to Catholicism at St. Elizabeth's Chapel, Chapel Hospital in Cologne, Lindenthal. Uh, she was baptised. She became a third order Carmelite of the convent of Echt. Um, this is a little detail which is important later. So, March of 1938, Hitler's troops invade Austria. Six months later, northern and western Bohemia and northern Moravia April 21st of 1938, Stein makes her perpetual vows as a Carmelite. Um, April 27th, but a few days later, Stein receives notice that Husserl has died. And considering the ongoing violence against Jews, uh, November 9th, 1928, was Kristallnacht, Stein requests now in the 38 a transfer to a foreign Carmel, but the routes were closed. She transfers to a Carmelite monastery in Echt, a small town in the Netherlands. And from here, really, we, we turn to the last years of Edith Stein. So, March 26, 1939, Edith Stein writes a letter to Mother Ottilia Tanish, prioress of the Carmela Act, where she was then. Dear Mother, please allow me to offer myself to the heart of Jesus as a sacrifice of property, propitiation for true peace, that the dominion of the Antichrist may collapse. If possible, without a new world war, and that a new order may be established. I would like it, my request, granted this very day because it is the twelfth hour. I know that I am nothing, but Jesus desires it, and surely he will call many others to do likewise in these days. Slowly, Stein becomes aware her family is spread far and wide. She asks many to keep her family in her prayers. This is mentioned in various letters. 
of which there is a great collection. As invasions broke out, Edith remained at peace in her internal world. She remained in prayer. Um, during her time at the convent in Ect, she had a deep influence on the younger sisters, arranging plays and skits as she once had, you know, when she was younger. From September 1941 onwards, Edith and her sister Rosa are forced, of course, to wear the yellow Star of David on their clothing. Uh, this can now be seen in many of the icons of Stein, which I've put one at the end. It is in these late years at Ect where Stein completes her text, The Science of the Cross, a book-length phenomenological meditation on the work of St. John of the Cross. In this text, the dark night of St. John of the Cross becomes a living reality, a living symbol. January 1942, the final solution for the Jewish problem is realised. And Sunday, August 2nd, 1942, at 5pm, just as silent prayer had begun, Rosa and Edith at the convent in Ect were seized by the Gestapo. The final words recorded by the sisters of the convent by Edith are, Come, let us go for our people. From here, as will come as no surprise, the details are extremely vague. Rosa and Edith were taken to Amersfoort and then an assembly camp at Westerbork. And really all we have here is two eyewitness reports of Stein, which I find so beautiful I'll read them in full. So the first one is from the Herbstreth. What distinguished Edith Stein from the rest of her sisters was her silence. Rather than seeming fearful, to me she appeared oppressed. Maybe the best way I can explain it is to say that she carried so much pain that it hurt to see her smile. She hardly ever spoke, but often she would look at her sister Rosa with a sorrow beyond words. As I write, it occurs to me that she probably understood what was awaiting them. She was, after all, the only one who had escaped from Germany as a refugee. And this would have given her a much better idea. As I say, in my opinion, she was thinking about the suffering that lay ahead. Not her own suffering. She was too resigned for that, but the suffering that was in store for the others. Every time I think of her in the barracks, the same picture comes to mind. A Pieta without the Christ. It was Edith Stein's complete calm and self-possession that marked her out from the rest of the prisoners. There was a spirit of indescribable misery in the camp. The new prisoners especially suffered from extreme anxiety. Edith Stein went among the women like an angel, comforting, helping and consoling them. Many of the mothers were on the brink of insanity and had sat moaning for days without giving any thought for their children. Edith Stein immediately set about taking care of the little ones. She washed them, combed their hair and tried to make sure they were fed and cared for. Finally, um, Rosa and Edith are transported to Auschwitz. So those two previous eyewitness reports are from Westerbork, which is an, was an assembly camp, basically. You waited there until the trains came and got you. Finally, of course, uh, Rosa and Edith are both transported to Auschwitz. And we, we have here the final account of the life of Edith Stein. So on the 7th of August, 1942... Uh, and the others in his unit were standing in the switching area of the railroad depot in Breslau, since their engine had been uncoupled for servicing. A freight train pulled into the station on the track next to theirs. A minute or so later, a guard opened a sliding door on one of the cars. With dismay, Venus noticed it was packed with people who were jammed together, cowering on the floor. Of course, he's speaking here of Auschwitz transportation, transportation trains. The stench coming from the car almost overpowered the men standing outside. Then a woman in nun's clothing stepped into the opening. Venus looked at her with such commiseration that she spoke to him. It's awful. We have nothing by way of containers for sanitation needs. Looking into the distance and then across the town, she said, This is my beloved hometown. I'll never see it again. When he looked at her questioningly, she added very hesitantly, We are riding to our death. He was profoundly shocked and asked in all serious, seriousness, Do your companion prisoners believe that also? Her answer came even more hesitantly. It's better that they do not know it. Johannes Venus served for a time, and then was taken a prisoner of war. When much later he was back in Germany, he saw a picture of Edith Stein accompanying an article about her. He was sure that she was the nun he had seen on August 7th, 1942. Stein's last act amidst a train of absolute despair and misery and suffering was one of simple thoughtfulness for others, uh, empathy and care. Yeah. All she wanted to ask for was a container just for sanitation needs and to make sure that others weren't aware of what was to come. And so 
the really the last thing we'll have of Edith Stein in 1950, um, a paper called the Dutch Gazette published all the names of all the Jews. This is in 1950, quite a few years later, all the Jews who had been deported from Holland on August 7th, 1942. And the following entry was found, number f- uh, 44,074, 44074, Edith Theresia Hedgefig Stein, Echt, born October 12th, 1891, Breslau, died August 9th, 1942. In reality, these aren't formal records. There are no formal records of Stein. Um... Because those designated for death at Auschwitz weren't registered. So there is no official notice of her death. Um, and so, uh, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross was beatified as a martyr on the 1st of May 1987 in Cologne. Germany, by Pope John Paul II, and then canonized by him 11 years later on 11th of October 1998 in Rome. So the miracle for this, and this is quite difficult to find the details of, um, the miracle that was the basis for her canonization is the cure of Benedicta McCarthy, a little girl who had swallowed a large amount of paracetamol, and the young girl's father, um, Uh, a priest himself immediately called together relatives and prayed for St. Teresa's intercession and shortly thereafter the nurses saw her sit up completely healthy and it was considered a miracle. She is also, uh, another reason for her beatification was and canonization was that she is considered um, a martyr um, for, for how she died. So she stands as the patron saint of those who have lost parents um, of Jewish converts and is one of the six six patron saints of Europe. Um, even though her life was snuffed out by the satanic evil of genocide, um, generally it's understood that her memory stands as a light undimmed in the midst of evil, uh, darkness and suffering. And I always like to think of her, her memory as a, a light which a light which stands undimmed in darkness, which is quite aware that it probably won't win. And perhaps he's even aware that it definitely won't win, um, but tries anyway. And Pope John Paul II said, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross says to us all, do not accept anything as the truth if it lacks love. and Do not accept anything as love which lacks truth. One without the other becomes a destructive lie. Thanks for watching my little talk on the life of Edith Stein and soon I'll tackle her work on the problem of empathy. Um, See you all then. Thanks.